Inquiring Minds, my name is Doug and I'm back with a very special video. Just one short two-year pandemic ago, I did a video thanking all of you viewers of my channel for getting me to 1,000 members. I filmed that video standing knee-deep in the snow surrounded by Rocky Mountains in Canmore, Alberta. Well, here we are two years later and my channel has reached a plateau I never thought possible with 10,000 subscribers. So I thought for 10,000 subscribers, I'd thank you all from sunny California. My mother always told me to follow my dreams and I wanted to be a fountain pen influencer on YouTube. So I went to college and university and I studied hard. Then I had a career as a designer in the professional theater. Then I had a career as a university professor. Then I gave all of that up to become a guitar salesman. But my goals were even higher than that, so I gave up my lucrative career, turned in my Long and McQuaid salesman tags, and holed up in my basement to make videos about the dying art of cursive writing using obsolete writing instruments for an audience of literally hundreds. You were right, Ma. Hold on to your dreams. For one day, you can make it to Southern California for seven days in the sun. And I want to thank each and every one of my 10,000 subscribers out there by giving each of you a chance to win another fountain pen to add to your collection of obsolete tools that will write in a script code that no one under 30 can decipher. And I'm so overjoyed at my new minor celebrity influencer status that I'm giving away one of my favorite fountain pens, my brand new Levant 325 Ocean Blue. And there was much rejoicing. I didn't bring it with me and it's safe at home. I've selected 10 of the many questions asked to answer here on camera. Then I will randomly select one of the 10 questions as the winner of the Levant 325. The winner will have 48 hours from now to contact me at inkquiringminds at gmail.com with your name and your address so I can send you your prize. No, I'm not stalking you and no, I don't ask for shipping charges. And for the rest of you, thank you for sending in your questions. It's much appreciated. And I'll get to answering as many of them as I can after this video is posted. It was a difficult process to select only 10 questions out of the more than 350 I received. I randomly selected 10 questions, and I've had my minor celebrity influencer staff compile them into these envelopes, which have remained sealed in a mayonnaise jar on the steps of Funkin' Wagnalls until this very moment. I have in my hands, the envelopes. A child of four could plainly see these envelopes are hermetically sealed. They've been kept in a mayonnaise jar on Funkin' Wagnall's porch since noon today. No one knows the contents of these envelopes but you. In your mystical and borderline divine way will ascertain the answers, having never before seen the question. Is that about it? Are you done? May I have the first envelope, please? Oh, thank you. First question comes from Adrian Angelo Cabadou. Congratulations, Doug, for achieving 10,000 subs on your channel. Keep it up. My first question is from your beloved guitar and fountain pen collection. Which one from each collection is your favorite go-to? Thanks in advance. Thanks, Adrian. I'll answer the pen question first because the guitar question is more involved. My go-to fountain pen is my first gold nib pen that I received from my wife two Christmases ago my Pilot E95S. It is always right next to my hand on my desk, always inked with a Roshizuku Kanpeki. It writes first time, every time, unless I forget to ink it up, and writes as smooth and slick as shit through a goose. As to my guitars, of my 11 guitars, the guitar you see in most of my video intros, including this one, is my Gibson SJ200 Golden Age Acoustic. It is simply the most amazing acoustic guitar I've ever played in my 52 years of playing guitar. But that's not the only reason it's my favorite and go-to guitar and no further than two feet from me when I'm at my desk. It is how I obtained the guitar. When I was selling guitars at Long McQuaid, this incredible instrument, which is one of only 75 produced by Gibson, came into the store on a trade. The price we put on that guitar was obscenely low, less than half of its value in my opinion. But the store put it in our annual attic sale event and employees were not allowed to purchase from that sale. I was severely depressed. Then my wife said, I don't work there. And she waited in the long line that formed outside before the doors opened for the sale. 
She marched in and bought the guitar within seconds of the doors opening and gave it to me. That's why it's my favorite guitar and she's my favorite girl. Question number two. Thank you. This question comes from The Crashed Mind. Hmm, sounds promising. Would you rather give up all of your guitars or all of your pens? This is an easy one. I would give up all of my pens before I gave up all of my guitars. Of course, you said all. I would give up my Campfire Epiphone acoustic guitar before I relinquished my Leonardo Momento Zero Grande Jonathan Brooks. I could buy six or seven Epiphones for that one pen. Question number three. This one comes from Stephen Johnson. Will Calgary get into the playoffs this season? Thank you, Stephen, for bringing up that painful subject. Will Calgary get into the NHL playoffs this season? The simple answer is yes. They are struggling to come together as a team right now, but if that roster of talent doesn't get into the playoffs, a lot of heads will roll. And question number four. This question comes from Ovi Bjornsson. Congratulations. Um, this is a very long question, Ovi, thank you. So I'm gonna paraphrase it. He basically asks, why don't Chinese pen makers offer a wider range of nibs? Interesting question, Ovi. And the answer is easy, because they don't have to. That's because the Eastern market is huge compared to the West, and Eastern kanji character writing lends itself to fine and extra fine nibs, unless they are writing calligraphy to simulate brushes, and then the fude nibs are very popular. But many Chinese companies are starting to introduce medium widths, which are more like Western fines, in any case, as options with their new models. I've seen Hongdian and Jinhao, among others, do this. And we're seeing more of the architect-style nibs from makers like Kaigalu, and they call them long blades or long knives. Plus, there's the huge range of specialty calligraphy nibs offered by PenBBS now, and that shows the responding to demand. And question number five. Whose idea was these envelopes? This question comes from Jeff Roberts. Hi, Jeff. Congratulations, Doug. Here's hoping for 20,000 subscribers. My question, what is the primary reason for your fountain pen passion? Can you nail it down to a single thing? Oops, two questions. Thanks for all the fun. Thanks, Jeff. This question requires a two-part answer, and luckily there are two questions related to this subject, so I'll answer the first part here. Jeff mentions my passion for fountain pens, so I'll address the start of my producing fountain pen reviews on my YouTube channel. Because I started using fountain pens when I was 12 or 13, but only really started collecting fountain pens when I started doing reviews three years ago. My good friend Ron has been a fountain pen user since I've known him, some 34 years now. Oh my god, 34 years. And Ron's dad, Dennis, wonderful guy, was also a fountain pen aficionado. I knew of Ron's passion for fountain pens and decided to get him one for Christmas a few years ago. A Facebook ad came across my screen that offered two nice looking fountain pens if I only paid $15 shipping. So I bit and I got two Jinhao X450s for 15 bucks. I inked them up and was really impressed with how they wrote. I thought about giving one to Ron, but this is a man who writes with a Visconti. So I kind of balked because I couldn't bring myself to gift him a $6 Chinese pen, no matter how beautifully it wrote. I bought him a cross instead. I kept one of those Jin Hao's and gave the other to my wife, Win. I thought, if I could get one of these for six bucks, and it's so awesome, what else is out there? So I started down the rabbit hole of watching eBay and watching Steven, Matt, and David's reviews on YouTube. I put together my first pen review on my YouTube channel, where previously i just share me noodling on my guitars, and I had about 100 subscribers. Well, that pen video got hundreds of views and comments, and it totally stunned me. That was 10,000 subscribers ago. The channel is a great hobby for me, being a retired theater production professor, and allows me to bring my various production skills from photography, audio and video editing, to writing and producing for my own work. Question six. This one comes from The Prof. Congratulations on reaching such a milestone. I heard somewhere that you were a professor before retiring. What subject matter did you teach? Thank you for that question, Prof. 
I taught theater production and design for 34 years. The last 25 were at Mount Royal University in Calgary, where I was the chair of the Department of Theater, Speech, and Music Performance. I taught lighting, sound, scenery production, and theater management, while designing lighting and scenery for university productions and in the local professional theater. On to question seven. This one comes from Buck Pucker. <laughs> Doug, congratulations on your teaching career. What did you most like and dislike? Any funny stories? <laughs> well, yes. So this is a bit of a follow-up from the previous question. After 34 years of teaching live theater, I have enough funny stories to fill a book. I'm getting a tassel in my face here. Let's move around. There we go. That tassel's still in my face. There. Certainly the hundreds of productions I've been involved in are a source of hilarity. Well, in retrospect, anyway. Like the time the suction of the main curtain opening pulled the entire set down, and the time the audience were moved by an amazing lighting effect in a production of Frankenstein, only to discover, to their real horror, that the set was on fire. Lots of fun in the theater. But in terms of the in-the-classroom anecdote, this one comes to mind. I had taught this one student for four straight semesters. He was one of those students who had a little bit of knowledge and experience, which is never a good thing. He was always contradicting me with his superior knowledge and experience. Lots of fun. But even more frustratingly, he was always, but I mean always, 10 minutes late for class. And Jamie had no excuse because he lived on campus. It was the final class of the fourth semester and I would never see Jamie again. He waltzes in 10 minutes late. I stopped and pointed at him and I said, for two years you've been constantly 10 minutes late for class. The last class, seriously, Jamie. He looked at me aghast and said in all seriousness, really, seriously, no, that's not true. Sometimes I'm five minutes late, sometimes I'm 15 minutes late. Well, the class loved it, of course, and so did I. After the class, he came up to me and told me I was the best teacher he had ever had and he would miss me. Needless to say, I remembered him. And question eight. Question eight comes from Torhildur. Okay, that's as far as I'm gonna go. I'm gonna let you pronounce the rest of her Icelandic name, which I think is pronounced Narwhal. Torhildur writes, I congratulate you on your rapid rise and wish you continued success. Which dimension do you think is most critical when, when it comes to ergonomics? In your opinion, what more, the diameter of the section, the weight distribution, the shape of the grip, or something else? And that's an excellent question, Torhilder, and I think I'm going to respond in a more philosophical manner than in dimensions or specifications, because I think the answer is, uh, it's all relative and subjective. But you're right that all of those elements are critical in how the pen feels and writes. Writing with a fountain pen is such a visceral experience that each of these elements will affect your subjective opinion of the pen and your experience will be unique to you, your preferences, your writing style, and your sensibilities. So yes, balance is important, the section shape and girth is important, the weight in the hand is important, but answer me this. Why do I absolutely love writing with my Pilot E95S, which is light and slim, but also just adore my Leonardo Momento Zero Blue Hawaii, which is heavier and much thicker? I guess the only way to describe it is all those elements of balance, thickness, girth, weight, and of course the feel of the nib on the page, when they come together and hit that sweet spot in my hand, not your hand, but my hand, that's fountain pen kismet. For me. And question number nine. This question comes from Gary Weisenberger and he says my question is how and when did you get into fountain pens? So this is the follow-up question to Jeff's question about my fountain pen passion. So this is the second part of that answer about when I first wrote with a fountain pen. A few others asked similar questions about my first fountain pen experience. I was in grade school in grade seven, I think, when I discovered a Schaefer student fountain pen. 
you know those pens with the blister pack for a buck fifty and it came with a pack of five cartridges I think I got mine at a stationery store called Grand and Toy. The very cool thing about it was that it had Schaefer's Scrip Peacock Blue cartridges. This color was so out of the ordinary that it immediately caught your eye. You have to understand that every school kid in 1969-1970 was writing with a standard blue Bic pen. So this vibrant turquoise, teal ink, especially the way it flowed across the page and shaded giving different nuances to the gorgeous color was totally unique. The peacock blue wasn't all that available, so I'd always trek over to the mall and check out Grand and Toy for boxes of that special color. I wrote with that fountain pen through high school, but abandoned it for mechanical pencils and technical pens when I started learning architectural drafting in theater school. Most fountain pens I've encountered over the next 30 years were scratchy and horrible, like the Schaefer VFM, the Cross Ventura, my Faber-Castell Loom, they all put me off until I discovered a Jinhao X450 three years ago. And question number 10. This question comes from Paul McHugh. Hi Paul. Do you think any pens from China have gotten close or perhaps equal the quality of European or Japanese pens? That's an excellent question Paul, thank you. I think generally you'll find the more affordable Chinese pens are made with materials of lesser quality than those of the top brands in Germany, Italy, and Japan, generally. But examples abound of reasonably priced Chinese-made fountain pens being made with superior materials and superb workmanship. Some of the pens coming from Hongdian, for example, are equaling the manufacturing quality of Western pens. I would say a plastic pen like the 14 karat gold nib Wingsung 629 piston filler is every bit as good, if not better, than the 14 karat gold nib Platinum 3776. The injection molded plastic of the Wingsung 629 is more seamless, feels more solid and smoother than the 3776, which has obvious injection molding seams and a relatively stiff gold nib. Have I seen anything from China with the engineering perfection of a Lamy 2000? Well, no, but I don't like the Lamy 2000 anyway. I would suggest the Japanese, Germans, and Italians need to continue to improve and innovate to keep ahead of the constant improvements from the Chinese. It wasn't that long ago that the West was laughing at the shoddy crap cars that Japan was making back in the 1950s. And where are they now? So, those are the questions. Thank you all for entering the contest. Now it's time to randomly choose one of these questions as the winner of the Levant 325 Ocean Blue Fountain Pen. And I put the numbers in this little pool skimmer and I'm shaking them up. And I'm gonna close my eyes and reach into the bucket and choose one number. And it's question number six. And question number six came from the prof. Congratulations, the prof. To claim your prize, please send me an email in the next 48 hours with your name and your address so I can send you your prize. And as always, if you like this video, please like and subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell to get instant notifications whenever a new video is posted. And thank you for watching. Bye-bye. I made this.